good day and welcome to my channel. This is Trip, and I appreciate you being here very much. Today is not going to be poetry. It's, it's going to be a little bit different kind of a, a presentation. It's a series of letters that were published in 1741, and they were written by the English author Samuel Richardson who lived from 1689 to 1761. The, the title for this book, it was really quite long, How to Think and Act Justly and Prudently in the Common Concerns of Human Life. That's the short title. The actual title is much longer. And this man wrote these letters as though he was giving advice to people on everything from, from finance and business to love and personal relationships. If you like these, I'll, I'll do some more of these. There are quite a few of them. So, even though this was written almost 300 years ago, the same advice, the same good sense prevails still today. It was kind of difficult understanding some of the text because it's really, a lot of it's antiquated, but anyway, I'm going to get into it. As usual, I'm talking too much, and I'm sure I'll have more to say after it's over. This is a letter one. To a father against putting a youth of but moderate parts to a profession that requires more extensive abilities. What he's saying here is that basically you don't want to put children or young people or anybody into situations which they may not be capable of handling in a, prof in a profession or a business sense. So here we are. Dear Sir, you pay me a compliment, though a very obliging one, when in the last letter you favored me with, you desire my advice with respect to the disposition of your son, William, whom you are inclined to bring up to the bar. If, in complying with your request, I should say anything you may not entirely approve, you will not have so much room to blame me as your own wrong choice of a counselor. I need not now tell you I have a good opinion of Will and think him a modest, grave, sober youth. But for this very reason, I hardly think him qualified for the profession you would choose for him. For I doubt he has neither talents for the law, nor ever will have the presence of mind necessary to make a figure at the bar. In any smooth, easy business, he will probably succeed and be a useful member of the Commonwealth. And as he is not your eldest son, I should, were it me, put him to a merchant, or, as we live in an island, and a trade and navigation are both our riches and our glory, I should not even scruple to put a second son to a creditable wholesale dealer rather than fail if he himself is not averse to such a calling. For I know not, you'll excuse me, I'm sure, whether Will's genius is equal to that of an universal merchant. For the various springs of commerce, 
the seasons for choosing proper commodities and numberless incidents that make a necessary return of gain precarious are full employment for the strongest judgment as a man by one ill-chosen venture often loses more than he gains by several successful ones. But this opinion of will, should you think it just, will be no obstacle to his succeeding in the world in some creditable, easy business. Though I think him unequal to the part you seem inclinable to allot him, yet he is no fool, and experience teaches us that in some sorts of business ample advantage may be made by very moderate talents with much reputation. These are principally such employments as merely consist in buying with prudence and in selling at a market profit. Hence, we see several wholesale dealers gain large fortunes with ease and credit, and without any other secret than the plain practice of buying at the best hand, paying for their goods punctually, and vending them always for what they are. In dealings of this kind, the fatigues are many. The fatigues are few. And clear, well-kept books are sufficient to shew at any time a man's loss or gain, for which, generally speaking, less than one forenoon in a week is sufficient. And yet, by a constant attention, in this easy manner, as good a character, and very often more money is to be gained than in professions that require an extraordinary genius, a perpetual attention, and a close and intense study, which very seldom succeeds neither. For see you not of hundreds of lawyers, how very few of them make a figure or get genteel bread, and how many, for want of courage, to appear at the bar, who yet have good parts and knowledge in the laws, are forced to confine themselves to chamber practice, in which it is, it is a long time before they grow noted enough to make a tolerable livelihood. As to what you hint of placing him in the physic tribe, I like this no better than the other. Consider only this one thing, how long it is before he will be capable of entering into business or reputation as a physician. If he ever does at all, for who chooses to trust his health to a raw and inexperienced young man? The law requires a sprightly imprudence. Impudence. If I may say so, the physic line a solemn one in the person who would make a figure in either. And do you think the will is grave enough of conscience that he ever can come up to that important deportment, that unblushing parade, which is the very essence of an English physician. So he may, in either of the professions, live over all his days and be quite unknown, for as practice in both faculties 
is the best teacher and theory the most uncertain guide. He may live to be 40 or 50 years of age and not come into any business that shall improve himself or benefit his consulters. Whereas in the way I propose, no sooner as he comes of age and fit to be trusted with the management of any affairs at all, but his seven years will be expired. And if he has not been wanting to himself in it, and if he be, he would have been much more so in an abstruser business. He will be enabled with the fortune you can bestow upon him to enter upon the stage of the world with great advantage and become directly a necessary and an useful member of the community. And my good friend, when you and I recollect that most of the noble families in the kingdom as well as the genteel ones had the foundations of their grandeur laid in trade. I expect not in such a country as ours especially that any objections to my advice will be formed either by you or your good lady on this score. If you have not more significant reasons proceeding from the boy's turn of mind and inclination, which I think should always be consulted on these occasions. For though I hope it never will be so in your case, yet nothing has been more common than that of two sons, the eldest brought up to the estate, the other to trade in the revolution of twenty or thirty years, the latter, through the extravagance of the former, has made himself eldest, as I may say, for by saving while the other has been spending, he has found means to keep the estate in the family, though it has been transferred upon the youngest and as it has then proved their worthiest branch. This, I think, deserves your consideration, and by viewing will in the same light I do, that of a well-inclined lad of moderate passions, great natural modesty, and no soaring genius, I believe you will think it best to dispose of him in such a manner as may require no greater talents than he is possessed of and may, in due time, make him appear in the face of the world fully qualified for what he undertakes. I am, sir, your very humble servant. Now I'll speak a little bit about it, not too long, I hope. But first, I invite you to subscribe, like, and comment. And if you want to support the channel, look in the video description. There's a way to do that. Now, upon reflection of this letter, the boy's name is William, as you already know. And the, the writer, presumably the author, Samuel Richardson, is saying that he doubts William will be particularly talented for law. And it would be better for him to take up some kind of business or trade for his father to put him with the merchant. And they had uh, apprenticeships. He speaks of England being, or Britain being an island, islands. 
and trade and navigation being so important to England at the time, that the boy would be better in business, buying and selling commodities, and to seek a gain on that. He says you should buy with prudence and sell at a market profit. The practice of buying at the best hand, paying for the goods punctually, and vending them for what they are. In a sense, he's telling him to buy low and sell high, which is always the goal in business or markets of any kind, including stock and bond markets, commodities, whatever. And he says that William can keep good books. It only takes uh, one part of a day per week and he will know what he has made. It's not real difficult. There are hundreds of lawyers, he said, who make very poor money. That's hard to imagine today. And he also cautions against his father putting him with the physic tribe. I think that, I don't think that means pharmacy. I think it is medicine, and he can build a reputation much faster going into business than becoming a physician. He says that Will might live to 40 or 50 and not really do much in business. People didn't live nearly as long back then. Then he speaks of the seven years. Maybe that's the apprenticeship period. I don't know. An abstruser business. I don't know what abstruser means. Maybe someone can tell me. He says here most of the, of the families in, in England, the noble families and the genteel ones, had the basis of their fortunes made in trade. The eldest child inherited the estate, the title, if there was one. The other would go into trade or the military or some profession. The first one, the one with the title, would often be guilty of spending too much. So that the, the younger child who went into trade or profession would be the one to save the estate and continue it on. He would have made the money. I hope you like this letter. And I might do more of these. This is Tripp, and I'm wishing you a very good week. Good day.